Good morning, church. <clears throat> I have my essentials up here, my Bible and Kleenex. So <clears throat> just beware. It's totally understandable. If you don't shake my hand, if we have a bad relationship and I shake yours, you'll understand why. <laughs> no, nah, just kidding. Turn in your Bibles to the Psalm 100. <clears throat> I was asked uh, already more than once today, how was your Thanksgiving? And usually when we ask that, we're talking about, uh, you know, where did you go? Who were you with? What did you eat? Uh, how much of it did you eat? Uh, all those kinds of things basically about the event, which by the way was born out of a, an appreciation for what God has done for us as a country and the great blessings that we have. And so that kind of typically is the, the question, but my question, and the, the, if you want to give this lesson a title, is how is your Thanksgiving? And that's just one little word, but it has a whole different kind of meaning to us. How is your Thanksgiving? This ongoing thing that's supposed to be a witness to the world that we're different than they are. How is this Thanksgiving? This thing that Paul says you're to do always in everything. I mean, how does that work, you know? Uh, this idea that somehow or another in every circumstance I find myself in, I can still have a Thanksgiving or a gratitude to God. And so that's really the challenge for us is, is to look at our lives and say, how, how is it going with my continual thanksgiving to God? And, and am I on target there? Because when I'm not, I'm in trouble. Uh, because ingratitude or a lack of thanksgiving always, it always gives birth to criticism, uh, gives birth to, to being judgmental, it gives birth to being privileged, uh, to uh, somehow or another people owe me. All those kinds of things come out of the fact that someone is, aren't, they're not appreciative of what they have. Matter of fact, in Romans 1, he makes it very clear when he actually lays out a whole condemnation uh, passage about people who have forgotten God. He says in chapter 1, they, they did not know God, nor did they give thanks to God. So a lack of thanksgiving is evidence that God's not on the throne in our life where he needs to be. And so I just thought, you know, for the day and for the weekend, that'd be pretty appropriate, I think, as God's people to say, how is my Thanksgiving? And I can't ask that question. I can't say the word Thanksgiving really without going to this Psalm uh, 100 passage. Uh, this is a unique psalm. Matter of fact, it, it, the very title of it says, A Psalm for Thanksgiving or Grateful Praise. And it's, uh, it's very unique. It's always been used by the people of God uh, for a long time. The, the Israelites would sing this praise of thanksgiving to God. Then it, 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 this became a psalm that was used constantly in the synagogue. This became a psalm that was used in the medieval church, in the 16th century church. This became a very habitual praise that was used in the assembly of God's people to say we don't want to forget to thank God and praise him for who he is. So as we look at that for just a little bit, I, I have up here also on the stand, I have a rock. And on this rock, I don't know if you can see it from out there, but on this rock is carved the gospel symbols or the drawing that we use in teaching people. Because when we fail to give thanksgiving we tend to be rock throwers and uh matter of fact i'm going to leave this up here and uh if you you can you're welcome to come and get it and that doesn't mean i think you're a rock thrower i started to give it to somebody in the audience i thought no they'll think i'm criticizing them uh but uh, i didn't want to throw it out there and do real damage you know it is a rock uh i do remember one time when i was real young uh my uh, matter of fact, my mother was uh, and brother were retelling this story. Just thinking about going home for Thanksgiving, they retell stories. And some of my uh, some of my family, they're kind of like some of these modern hist history people. They changed the history of it to me, anyway. <laughs> but there was a superintendent that wasn't well liked, and he was driving by our, our house one day, and I was young, and I threw a rock, and I, uh, uh, 
Now, you know, my brother said, I know you didn't mean to do it because you weren't that good at aim. And I, I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm, you know. And I threw it, and it went through his window. It was rolled down and over into the lap of his wife. And he stopped the car quickly, and I ran around the back of the house quickly and up inside. And, boy, he comes storming up. He was kind of a, not a very happy guy to begin with. You know what I'm saying? And so this just made him worse. So when he came up up on the porch using colorful language and about how my mom ought to do this and do that, you know what? It didn't take long. If he'd have left her alone, she would have took care of the problem. I'm standing behind her, hanging on to her leg. And all of a sudden, when he started going that route, no, no, she took care of me. She had my back. Well, really, I had her back, and she was, you know. Uh, throwing rocks is a dangerous thing. Oh, you're not out in the yard as a kid throwing them anymore. You get on your computer and you launch them out through Facebook. Amen. Right? You launch them out through those small pebbles through Twitter and you throw, launch them out. The, however, you know, we can get that criticism or that heart. And what that a consistency of that tells you, somebody's not thankful. So I thought, you know what? The gospel on a rock is a good reminder about being grateful one I don't want to be a rock thrower and I don't want to be too close to those that are throwing them all the time either thankfulness how is your thanksgiving let's just break down the verse first of all what's involved in this psalm that says that, that we're going to thank God now there, there are three things in the first two verses he says let's just, let's just read the whole thing then I'll come back and break down the verses Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship or serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. May God bless the reading of his word. Father in heaven, we ask today that you remind us through your word and through the movement of your spirit that we are to be people of gratitude. May your word move our hearts and teach our minds and be active in our lives as we are witnesses to the world as your children to lift up and be examples of Jesus in all we do may you enable us with understanding and with wisdom to walk with a spirit of gratefulness in any circumstances, in all times, and in all ways. In the name of Jesus, with the help of the Spirit, we pray, and the church says, Amen. So first of all, the question, what? What's involved in this? He says three things. First thing he says is shout. Shout to the Lord. Now, now, shouting's kind of gotten a bad name because sometimes Satan's taken that idea of shouting and used it in our marriages with our kids and all those kinds of things, right? And, uh, but, but really, shouting was what they did when royalty came in. There was a great shout from the crowd to acknowledge the greatness of the royalty that was there. And he tells God's people here, he writes, that we are to shout to who? We shout to the Lord. We recognize his greatness. We recognize his, uh, his, his, loyal, his royalty. We shout to the Lord all the earth. Everyone, we want everyone to hear. Throughout all the earth, we shout to the Lord. And we're not much of a shouting church. You know, we got, we got, we get, well, we, you know, we are, we have one designated shouter, right? Anybody know who that is? Kurt? Where's, uh, Kurt, are you here today? Where are you? There he is. There's a shouting brother right there. That's what I call him, the shouting brother. And, and, amen, brother. And so, you know, he shouts out what? Jesus. Give, us a, give us a sample of that, Kurt. Jesus. Jesus. 
Saat to chinau. I thought, you know, it ain't, it ain't right for old Kirk to feel all alone by himself and that. We just ought to do that with him a time or two. Since we're talking about shouting, we might as well practice the verse. So uh, we're going to count to three, and we're going to shout Jesus the way Kirk shouts Jesus. Is that okay? One, two, three. Jesus! Man, that's a great sound, isn't it? You really wasn't that good. I could still have Kurt over everybody. But, I, but you did, you know, you did pretty good. Shout to the Lord. And acknowledge me. Isn't that good? Look, that's an exuberance. That's an enthusiasm that comes that we are obeying the Word of God, but we're practicing this acknowledgement of the greatness of God. And he says the other thing we're to do is to not only shout, but to serve. He said, you serve the Lord with gladness. Now, serving is something you make a decision to do. It's not within our nature to do it, right? It's in our nature to be selfish. We don't pull a bunch of kids up and say, okay, who, you know, uh, we're going to do some serving things, and who wants to take out the trash? And they're all saying, me, me, me. You know, it's, that doesn't work that way. <laughs> Typically, we kind of we, we kind of have to be taught to serve. Matter of fact, that's the way it is with thankfulness too, right? We have to teach our kids to say what? Thank you. It ain't, it's not something that's natural. We have to teach that, you see. And so he says we serve the Lord or we worship the Lord. It's the same, it's the same idea and the same word in, we find in Romans chapter 12 when he talks about that, he, that we beg when we see the mercies of God. He says, I, I, I beg you by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. God, well, don't, don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's that, that's your, that reasonable service or worship. And we understand worship is more than what takes place in a room. Sir, or the same word, service, is more than what takes place in here as a group of people. He says, you serve the Lord with gladness, and you come before him with joyful what? Songs. So you shout, you serve, and you sing. And singing is one of those things that's so vital to people of God through all the ages. Remember when they were delivered and came across and Miriam uh, did her song and her tambourine and she's singing to God for the deliverance. She writes and sings a song of deliverance and Moses, her brother, joins in with her and uh, they had this duo worship team going on for the whole nation and they're singing about the deliverance of God. And Isaiah pictures them singing, let the redeemed sing to God. Because something's been happened in their life. They've been bought back. They've been redeemed. And, and we've always been a singing church. There's something really good about that. Now look, this is why we need to stay healthy spiritually. Hurt people don't sing very good. And so when we carry our hurts in here to one another, and we, it's while we minister to each other is one thing. But to hang on to hurts that are long been forgiven by God, that don't put you in a singing mood. But music moves the soul and the heart of man. We shout. This is what's involved. Shouting, serving, singing those songs of deliverance. Well, how, how do we do that? In other words, what's the basis? What enables, what empowers us to be able to practice this kind of thing here in song? What's the basis of it? He says in the next verse, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. The basis for shouting and singing and serving. Are you listening? The basis is not our emotion. If we're only going to sing and shout out of the base of our emotion, then we're going to be up and down all the time because our emotions go everywhere, don't they? Right? I mean, they're up, they're down. You know, I'm, uh, and, and some of us have more emotions than others, right? Right? Some genders tend to have more emotion. I'm not going to go too far there. I'm just saying, if you're newly married, you need to recognize that right off the bat. 
emotions. They're different. They're not the basis by which we serve and worship God. And yet so many people think that's it, so they're going around looking for the next emotional event or worship experience to somehow or another say, man, that high was great, now I can really serve God. And yet it never, because it's always going to go up and come down, go up and come down. That's, that's not what he says here in Psalm. It's not based on our emotion. You know what it's based on? Knowing God. What I know takes priority over how I feel. Now get that statement again. What I know takes priority over how I feel. Now what I do know about God is that he is the creator of me. It is he who has made me. And I'm, I'm his, we're his people all together here. We're the sheep of his pasture. He's the shepherd, we're the sheep. And you know how a shepherd responds to the sheep? When they're wounded, the shepherd is there to take care of them in their hurting times. And when they're wounded and when they're broken, when, they, when they've had tough situations, the shepherd is there to scoop them up, to carry them, to help them, to heal them. That's my confidence in God. Now that's what I have to think about in my times of woundedness. When I am wounded or when I am hurt, if I only find myself thinking about myself, if I'm thinking about why is this happening to me and poor me and this and this and everybody else looks like life's going great, if I get caught up in thinking about myself too much for too long a period, then I will, I, I, I will all of a sudden become a very discouraged person. But if I can understand that when I'm wounded, be reminded that God, I know... Not emotionally, not when I feel like it, not when I feel close to God. I know God. I know he made me, and I know he cares for me, and he loves me, and he will take care of me in my wounded and broken times. God does not cast you away or throw you aside because you messed up in life. He's not going around rescuing healthy people. The healthy don't need a doctor, remember? It's the sick. So in your woundedness, don't trust your feelings as the measure of whether God is with you or not. Trust what you know about God. That he made you, that he loves you, and that you are his sheep. Well, where does all this take place? That's what he says in the next verse. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. It, it, this happens at the gathering of God's people. It's entering the gates together. This is a corporate thing that's talk, it's talking about here. It's talking about us being together. Someone says, yeah, Mike, it's talking about going to church. Well, it's not about that. I mean, it would include that, but it's more than that. If it's entering his gates, we do it with thanksgiving. Why? Because we know there's no other way to enter. We, we don't belong there. Now, I was up in Arkansas over the holidays, and so... My wife and daughter and, and uh, my brother, we drove up to, to see his place. He lives, uh, well, uh, in, in the middle of nowhere. It's, uh, it's in the north part of Randolph County, about eight miles from the Missouri border. There's nothing around there. You go off the paved road onto a gravel road, and then you, get, you cross a couple of other people's land, and then you have to go through a gate. So you got to get out. Some of y'all live, grew up in farmland like this. You got to, somebody has to get out and be the gate person, right? And so I'm totally willing to let my brother do that. And so <laughs> he gets out. So right, but we're pulling up to the gate, and, he, and, and my brother is kind of funny. He, he, he leans back to Kristen and Susan, and he says, you see, uh, I live in a gated community. <laughs> and he opens the gate, and we go in. 
uh, we enter his gates with thanksgiving. You know, you can't just go up and walk in anybody's gate. You go to the gates of the White House, they don't just let anybody in. But if you walk there with the right person, and they say, he's what? He's with, he's with me. You go right in. You didn't go in on your own merit. You didn't go in on your own credit. You went in by the strength and character or access that someone else had. So when we enter his gates, we enter them with thanksgiving because we can't get in the gates ourselves. Matter of fact, your name has to be on a list. They're going to check that list at the gate. Is your name on here? Yeah. My name's on there. Revelation says there's a name in the book of life. There's also a name in the book of death. And these names, they're all headed for a different, different place. I don't want to be a part of that. But here your name is written in the book of life. And you didn't write it there. Jesus Christ wrote it there in blood that says as you come to the gates, he says to the Father and Heavenly Host, he's with me. He's with me. I'm with the King. I can go straight on into the gates. And because I'm doing that by no merit of my own, what do I go in with? I go in with thanksgiving and praise based on his grace, his journey, his love. For me, one who did not deserve it. Why? Why why do we come in with this kind of thanksgiving? Verse 5. For the Lord is good. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. There's a saying a lot of churches have used over the years. God is good all the, and all the time God is, he really is. You see, we must have confidence in the goodness of God. If we're going to be a people who look at our own thanksgiving, and we're going to be able to thank God in every circumstance, always, then there has to be this confidence that God's purpose is being fulfilled no matter what is going on in my life at the time. No, it doesn't matter about my circumstances, whether it's a difficult situation or not, whether uh, whether I think I deserve to be treated like this or not, uh, it doesn't matter. There's a purpose to my life God is working, Romans 8, 28, all things out to the good, right? To the good of those that love the Lord. God has that ability to be in the manipulate and work in our mess-ups and in our mistakes. And he turns those messes, messes into messages. He turns it into something great. And God, I have to remember, is good. And he will take care of me. You see, he says, far. Why can I enter his gates of thanksgiving and his courts will break? Far the Lord is good. And in this goodness we see that his love, or some versions say his mercy, or steadfast love, it endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. God always keeps all his promises. I love the last part of this, faithfulness through all generations. Let me tell you why. Because I, I and, and I've, I've said these kind of statements before too. I look at the world and I see how terrible the situations are. And they're different than how I grew up. And, and uh, uh, you know, uh, so I, I see it. It looks like the world's going in a bad way. It looks like it's headed downhill around our nation sometimes. It's real easy to say things like, man, I, I'd hate to try to raise kids nowadays, right? I mean, what's it going to be like for that next generation well let me give you a little reassurance here's what it's going to be a lot for that next generation God is faithful from generation to generation 
God's not exiting the building anytime soon. He's not leaving the situation. His church is here. His people are here. And he will be faithful to your kids and your grandkids and their kids. And God's promises will stand true. And his word will stand strong. And his message will stand powerful in saving the world around us. We've got to recapture our faith in God. His love is steadfast. And his faithfulness will be through all generations. So when I see my kids and they're growing in their faith, you know what? I don't have to worry about them. I just praise God. I know your faithfulness to them. They're your sheep. You'll take care of them when they're wounded. You'll help them when they're weak. You won't forsake them. And I'll trust you in that, God. I'll trust you in that. That's a much better place to be than those who have a lack of faith who are always worrying about the next bad thing that's going to happen. He did not save you to get rid of you or cast you off in a moment of weakness. Remember what the prophet said? A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. You know what that means? A reed is a little old thin stick, and they're easily broken. And if it's got a bruised place on it, it will break even easier. And what the prophet says is, look, God doesn't do you that way. Just because you have a bruised place on you, he doesn't break you in that place of weakness. And when your fire goes out and you're kind of just got a little smoke going, irritating the eyes of God, he doesn't snuff you out. He's going to flame in the fire what he needs to. A bruised reed, he won't break. God's not going to break you in your weakness. God is not up in heaven with a big stick and a big all-seeing eye. That's what I always heard sung at my church, right? There's an all-seeing eye, what? Watching you, watching you, and it was like, I mean, he's especially watching you, and I mean, I felt scared to death. He's watching me, you know, and so I'm waiting with a big stick, waiting for you to stump your toe and say a bad word where you can bump, I got you. God does not enjoy the I got you. God looks down in your bruised moment and is careful with you and strengthens you and heals you and forms you to look like Jesus and as you say thank you to the world, you become a witness of what God's done for you through Jesus Christ. So this week, it's okay to look and check how is my Thanksgiving? Is it continual? Is it in everything? Even the world can be thankful for blessings that come along. You know, now, the atheists have a hard time because they get an overwhelming feeling of, I ought to be thankful, but they have nobody to go to, right? But even the world can be thankful for good things, but God's people have a different witness and testimony for we're thankful in every circumstance, even if we can't understand it, because it's not based on our understanding, it's not based on our feelings, it's not based on our heart. It's based on knowing God, and here's how God takes care of his people. So when I'm tempted to gripe a little, when I'm tempted to be critical of a brother or sister, when I'm tempted to uh, throw a rock, I hope etched in my heart is the story of the gospel that could remind me that I'm in a much better place for shouting, for serving, for singing. And I walk into gates introduced by the king himself. And I don't even have to worry about those next generations because God will keep on taking care of his people. Father, we love you. 
we are weak and it's real easy in our own sinfulness to get caught up into where we just think about ourselves and our own hurts and messes. Help us, Father, transform our minds and our thinking. Help us to trust you more than our feelings. Help us, Father, to be a people who are con that's continually thankful and grateful in all circumstances, in every way, and at all times. I'm thankful today, Father, for this church family, for everyone sitting in this room, for the encouragement they give me in life and for what they do for the kingdom that I get to watch and see the impact as their light and salt in this world. And it's exciting, Father, to see you work through the folks in this church family. May we be submissive to you. May we walk humbly. May we love mercy. And may we be a people who are forever grateful, who enter your gates with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have a need today to respond, be prayed for, to come be baptized, to any need at all, that's what we're going to do at this time. If you'll stand, we'll have a song now.